Thank you, John, for the very nice introduction. Can everybody hear me? Okay, I'm a, I have a little bit of a sore throat, so if, you, if I'm talking too low, you let me know and I'll speak louder. I also want to th thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to participate in this conference, which so far has been nothing short of inspiring. I am really impressed by the quality of the talks that I have been sitting in so far and the clarity of the presentations. So thank you. It's, a, it's been a source of great inspiration so far and it's only going to get better. Um, let's see now. So credits, I'm going to talk about in my, in my first slide in every talk that I give, I like to mention my collaborators. Um, in this case, I'm not going to talk about my work. I'm going to talk about work that I admire greatly, and it goes back to almost 2,000 years ago and ends just from a few months ago, a paper that appeared in November of 2022. Um, this is loosely related to my own research, but there will be no mention here of the work that I do. So if you're curious to know about that, I will be around throughout the end of the day. Um, so, by the way, about the title of this talk, um, how many people have read or are aware of the Harry Potter books? Let's have a show of hand. How many people have read the Harry Potter books at least once, more than once? How many people have read the little books that J.K. Rowling started to write in the early 2000s, after all of the Harry Potter books were out. You know, the, the one about the fantastic beasts and how to tame them, you know, those ones. So there was one of these little books that she, was, she wrote for charity work titled Practical Uses of Magic. This was around the year 2008, which is precisely when I started working on this talk. And it's been a labor of love ever since, you know, every year there is an update. And at that time I realized that I, it would not be a bad idea to lift the title of her book and apply it to this, because as far as I'm concerned, in the realm of mathematics, complex analysis is as close to magic as one can get. And so we will be focusing on, uh, let's just establish some language of course, you're all very familiar with this, but we want to have our notations straight. And so to begin with in a talk like this, one has to introduce the notion of imaginary unit, which is, as we all know, one of the two solutions of this beautiful algebraic equation, the equation x squared plus one equals zero, which cannot have a real valued solution because the left hand side, if x is real, is at least greater than or equal than one. And so, the, we know that the fundamental theorem of algebra says that there have to be solution. And so we, we, we give a name to this solution, which is not real. We call it the, the imaginary unit. And you see there's a little unhappy face over there. I think, you know, marketing matters in all fields in mathematics as well. Language matters. And the problem with imaginary is that if you talk with some people in Congress and you tell them that you work with imaginary numbers, they'll think that you're doing research which doesn't exist. And so they're not very fond of the idea of funding it. So I think we should think of a better name for the imaginary unit, which exists very much, although it's not real. And so once you have an imaginary unit, of course you form complex numbers. And then once you have complex numbers, you can form the operation of product because you have defined the product of the imaginary unit with itself to be the quantity negative one. And so you have complex numbers and then you can design those on the complex plane, which is pretty much the same as the Cartesian plane. And then you can work with functions of the complex variables from subsets of the complex plane to the complex plane. And because we can think of the complex plane as the Cartesian plane R2, so we can think of a, a complex variable function as being vector valued, people often call these functions maps, which is the language that in engineering people use for vector valued functions. And so the focus is on conformal maps. 
which are rather special. But before we get to the definition here, I want to make a very short digression to say how much I enjoyed the talk that we heard yesterday from Alejandra, and which reminded me that I'm a little bit jealous of my colleagues in uh, number theory, because you know number theory is this very powerful discipline where people, I'm thinking of cryptography here, could use it to save the world or destroy the world. But in fact, I think that the greatest power of number theory is that it is the perfect vehicle to bring raise an interest for mathematics among the general public. The reason being that with number theory, it's very, very easy to state in a very precise way, a really beautiful and very difficult problem. And the Kotlet's conjecture that the professor was telling us about yesterday is a perfect example. I had not never heard of it before, I have to admit, and within the first five minutes of the talk, you almost lost me because I started computing trajectories in my mind. And, and you know, I had to remind myself that I could do that later with pen and paper. Unfortunately, analysis most of the times doesn't offer this capability, right? I mean, when you talk about analysis to someone who is not initiated in mathematics, you have to start with this much background, right? And by the time you get to this much background, you have lost them. The one exception to the rule is conformal maps. To give a precise definition of conformal map, you don't even need, you do not need a piece of chalk or pen and paper. You could, in fact, dance it. You could hip hop dance it, which I'm just about to attempt. <laughs> you could tell a person that a conformal map does the following thing. You start with two curves that intersect and at some angle, and it, they could be very boring. They could look like this. And then you apply your conformal map, which could be very crazy, and so this curve could change a lot. But then they end up into something that looks, might look very strange. However, if the original curves were intersecting at a certain angle, the output curves will be intersecting at the very same angle. And that is a perfectly rigorous definition of conformal map, which one can give without making any mistake right, and uh, convey the sense of what that is about. Now, all of this happens on a small scale, because on large scale, shapes of objects can be greatly deformed, which is what makes the subject especially interesting in my mind. And so then, this person that you have been chatting with on the elevator and you have been dancing, you know, the conformal map for, by the time they're about to step out, they say, they'll tell you, okay, I have a pretty good idea what a conformal map is. But in order for it to be really interesting, you should give me examples of interesting conformal maps. There is no point in building a theory if there are no interesting examples that it applies to. And so you start like this, rigid motions, and, and the person will say, Mah. Do we really need a theory that to encompass rigid motions? Okay, dilations are going to be a little more interesting. But the place where things get really interesting is when you start talking about inversions, the Joukowsky map, which we will be talking about later, and complex powers, which all happen to be conformal maps where well defined. Right, and for, for complex powers, well, you can justify it easily when alpha is a positive integer, because we know how to do z times z, and so then we know how to do z times z times z. But then, of course, you have to tell them, but there is also a way of making sense to the, of this when the exponent is not just a positive integer, but rather any complex number. And so let's give an example of a conformal map, a very important one, and I'm cheating already because I was giving you a definition for maps defined on the plane, but this one is defined on the sphere. But if you think about it, this idea of curves that meet at an angle and land into curves that meet at the same angle makes sense in any dimension. So the notion of conformality also makes sense for maps that are defined on the sphere. And here we have the prototype example, which goes back to Ptolemy almost 2,000 years ago. And here we have a beautiful depiction of it by Peter Paul Rubens, one of the greatest representatives of 
uh, Baroque art. So let's look at this beautiful, this beautiful print. So you have the universe, which is a three-dimensional sphere in R3, right there, which is sitting on Atlas' shoulders. That was Atlas' job at the time. And then you have this cherub here who is shining a light through the universe. And what this does, this casts a shadow on the ground. The ground is the complex plane. And so then you have these two other cherubs. You see one really knows what he's doing, and he's explaining to the other. And I'm sorry, you know, one would like to make the pictures bigger, but we can't. But if you look carefully, the other one is like, yes, I see, I see what's going on. And, uh, and so you see, there is a function that takes points on the universe to points on the ground. And we have a, an explicit map for it, and this is the stereo, stereographic projection, which I think was mentioned in Edwin's talk, perhaps yesterday, yes? Very good. And you see, and it has this specific precise formula. And it turns out that this is conformal in the sense that it preserves angles in the way we have described. So let's do a little bit of a digression because mathematics is really a very human subject. It's about people. And we tend to forget the people side of mathematics in, you know, in real, in everyday world under the tyranny of time. Um, so this image of Rubens is one of six plates that he made, which was an illustration for this book, Six Books of Optics, by this person, Francois de Guillon, in the, you see, he lived in, uh, around this time, who was a polymath. He was a mathematician, a physicist, an architect, and also a Jesuit priest. And it's kind of interesting to take a look at the book cover and also this portrait. Portraits were very important at that time. There were no cameras. So, you, you know, people would spend a lot of money to get their portrait made. And it was that one portrait for most people. So it was really important to the people being portrayed what kind of image they were projecting, living for posterity, right? And so you see, in this, in this cover, he says that he is a Jesuit priest. But if you look at the portrait where he's talking about my, himself, the person that he is, I see a lot of geometry, I see physics, I see geography, I don't see, I don't see any religious symbol, right? And there is also this very beautiful caption here. Okay, my Latin days were from a while ago, so you will forgive me if I'm not being very precise, but it says that this is a philosophy book which is useful to mathematicians. So it was stating very clear what the priorities were. And so now, there is a little bit of historical mystery going on here, because you see, in this picture, you see that this is the universe, but you have a tiny little ball right there that's being projected to the ground. And the question is, what is it? What's that ball? See, we are in 1613. And at that time, there was this major controversy on heliocentrism that was going on. OK, let's see if I can do that. It was started you know, about 50 years earlier by Copernicus, and it had been reignited by Kepler just a handful of year before the pub years before the book was published. And so in this context, there's only two options for the answer to this question. Either the center of the universe is the Earth, or it is the sun. And the interesting thing is that the picture doesn't say. There is no caption. And so we could think, you know, we could pretend that we're in court and we're making arguments against and in, and in favor of either one, right? Either answer. What kind of arguments in favor can one make for the ilios, uh, geocentric argument? The, the center is the earth. Well, at the time, the Catholic Church was a major power and it supported geocentrism. Daguillon was a Jesuit priest. He was a member of the church. And also, it was very dangerous to disagree with the church at that time on theological matters. Think about my you know, fellow countryman, Giordano Bruno, also from, well, not from Rome, but was, I'm from Rome, and he was burnt at the stake in Rome. And that was because 
he was deemed heretic, and that's because he supported heliocentrism and he postulated the existence of other solar systems. Can you believe what a crazy person that was? And he paid for his, with his life. So what are arguments in favor of the heliocentric theory? The center is the sun. First of all, most scholars supported the heliocentric theory at the time. First and foremost among them, Galileo Galilei, who would later withstand trial because of his beliefs and was sentenced, you see, 20 years after the book was published, to a lifetime house arrest. He died in his home. The second reason is that Rubens was, in fact, a personal friend of Galileo. They spent eight years under the same roof in the city of Mantua, which is outside of all of the tourist guides. And so I strongly recommend you go and visit Mantua the next time you're in Italy because it's, it's a gem, it's beautiful. And, uh, and they spent eight years together at the court of Vincenzo Gonzaga and corresponded throughout the rest of their lives. What were they doing there? Well, Rubens was the court painter. He was painting everybody's portraits, among other things. And Galileo was the chief astrologist. You know, at the time, there were very few universities, and those that were there wouldn't pay a salary to professors. There was no calculus. How do we, people in academia, mathematicians, support ourselves, really? By teaching calculus. Well, there was no calculus. So what can you do? You become the chief astrologist, right? Um, the, Jesuit, the Jesuit order supported all kinds of scientific pursuits, which, by the way, is true to this day. And in particular, they even awarded Galileo an honorary degree, which, of course, was conveniently withdrawn the day that he was sentenced. So you see that you can make a case for and against pretty much fairly. And so what's at the center of the universe? It's clear that both the author and the artist had good reason to not take sides, to withdraw putting a caption. Because if you were to say, well, this is the sun, you would alienate the church. And if you were to say this is the earth, you would alienate your customer base. <laughs> so it's really a no-win, lose-lose situation. Today, it's hard to imagine the uproar that must have been caused by this image and the lack of supporting information. So, what is at the, end, at the center of the universe? For many, many years, I really couldn't tell. I wasn't able to find any information about one way or the other. But then, a short while ago, a little over a year ago, I had just happened to visit this astronomy museum in Bologna. And then I get into a room which is full of objects that all look like the universe in <laughs> Rubens' print. And that's where I learned that there is a name for those objects. They're called armillary spheres from armilla, which is the beautiful arm bra bracelets that Roman ladies would put around their arms, right? Because of all of these things that look like those bracelets. Here is a beautiful example from the Galileo Museum in Florence. And so the staff, you know, I got very excited once I saw all of these things. And I said, can I talk to someone that knows about them? And they put me in touch with their science expert, you know, uh, liaison with the public, Professor Paula Focardi. And she said, well, of course, Rubens' armillary sphere is geocentric. Anyone, anyone can see that. And it's even a really simple one which is just depicting the Earth, the ecliptic, and a few celestial parallels. I was pretty much lost at that point, but you have seen the picture of the sphere in Florence, and it's clear that the one in Rubens is a simpler one. So then I asked her, OK, but how do you know that the center is the Earth and not the sun? And she said, that's because, the sun, because of the size of the angle between the ecliptic and the celestial parallels. So we're talking about this angle. And so we're talking about conformal maps again, two curves intersecting at an angle. So let's end the digression here. And I appreciate your patience. 
So let's see, let's see an application of, the, of this particular conformal map. Remember, we're in the 1500s, right? In the 1600s, in fact. But at that time, the new world had been discovered, meaning that most people in the Western world, in Europe, knew about the Americas. And so everyone wanted to go there for commercial and other you know, despicable purposes, but nonetheless, they wanted to go there. But in order to go there, you need a map. And what do you need more precisely? You need a flat map that a sailor can actually use to go from point A to point B. And so how do you do that? Well, the first way to do that is to squash the world on a flat surface. Right? Disregard the fact that the sphere has positive curvature. So if you do that, oops, sorry, if you do that, this is the kind of map you get. The good news is that areas are perfectly preserved. The bad news is a sailor cannot use this because how do you sail through a cut? So this method is just not suitable for the particular purpose we have in mind. And so then there's another method, which is to apply the stereographic projection. On the left here, we have, we are reminded of how it works. Can anybody guess what this little picture is? Whose person is that? Of course you can't, but see it, but a guess? It's Poincaré, for whatever reason. I just got this from public domain. All the pictures are from public domain. So I'm not really applying the stereographic projection to get this. This is the Mercator projection, which means that your sheet where you're projecting is not underneath the, um, the sphere, but it's rather wrapped around it like a cylinder. And you're not projecting from the North Pole, you're projecting from the center. And so then you're going you know, like this, and then you open up the sheet, and that's what you get. So what's the bad news? Let's start with the bad news. I claim that there is large scale, uh, large scale area distortion. How do we see that? We see that by looking at Greenland. First of all, let me get, let me clear my head, get my gripe off against uh, uh, Rand McNally. Painting Greenland green, really? Okay, that's out of the system. So. I have my little piece of paper here, but maybe we could do some data mining together. If someone has their cell phone, please take it out. Let's have two people, one looking for the surface area of Greenland and the other one looking for the surface area of Africa. And as we do our data mining, let's just pretend that we are aliens from outer space who have no information about Earth other than this one picture. So based on this one picture, I would say that Greenland is at least as large as Africa, right? Based on that one picture. But then, once we mine our data, what do we find out? Has anybody figured out? Did we get any numbers or do, should we go back to low tech and my piece of paper? It's much larger. On what kind of scale? Yes. Let's be generous, let's say 1 million, right? And let's be, let's be mean, let's say 10 million. <laughs> so the reality is that Africa is at least 10 times as big as Greenland, but you would never tell from this map. In fact, there is an even bigger piece of cheating. What, where is the real cheating that, that Ren McNally is really sweeping under the rug almost literally? based on the way we describe this map as being designed. Yes, sorry. Yes, and what happens, and also what happens, and what about down below? Yes, so based on this map, how big should the South uh, Antarctica be? Yes? It should be infinitely large. No wonder they're hiding it, right? <laughs> so this is the, these are the bad news. But remember, you're a sailor from the 1500s, and all you hear about is sailing your 50 miles a day, which is pretty much what sailors could do on a good day at the time, which means that this map has no cuts. That's good news. 
And true, on large scale, we have major distortion. But on small scale, we don't. Remember the angle thing? And so, on small scale, this map is just fine. And that's precisely what a sailor needs. So what's the takeaway? The takeaway is that you work with maps that are being obtained by localizing the stereographic projection. So this is an example of a polar stereographic projection. It is, of course, used for navigation in polar regions. Um, the scale is correct near the North Pole, which is the center of the projection. And it increases away from the North Pole, as does distortion of area and shape. So you would definitely not, to want, not want to use this map to navigate, say, the coast of France, right? You would want to use it to move around here. And we also point out that the projection is conformal. The longitude and latitude uh, curves are um, perpendicular, just as they should be. Of course, that's an invertible map. And there is a lot of software online that you can play with to produce you know, inverses of stereographic projection. Like you know, with this one, you start with a picture of a neighborhood. And then you do whatever you do with your software, don't ask me. And you can wrap it around the Earth, right? And get the inverse map, the one that goes from the, from the flat surface to the round surface. Of course, all the interesting stuff happens behind the, this hemisphere. But let's say, you see there is a little person here, a human being. So you see, from where we stand, there is this terrible distortion that we can see from where we stand. But from the point of view of this person, put yourself in their shoes, you don't see it, right? And so, for their purposes, this is good enough. Of course, you know, the fact that they don't see the curvature would lead us to another controversy, but that's for another day. So let's look at another application. Art and Rosti pictures. What's the Rosti effect? It's what happens when you have a repeating visual effects that occurs when an image contains a copy of that same image, which in turn contains a copy of that same image, and on and on and on. So it takes its name after this iconic box of cocoa from the Dutch maker Drosty. I grew up with the stuff. And I'm sorry I didn't bring a box along to share, to offer the organizers for their excellent work. I apologize. Um, and we can see here what's going on. We have a lady. She's holding a tray. There's a cup, a mug on it. And on this tray, there is a picture of the very same box. And the rest is history. By the way, can anyone guess what's the profession of this lady? What does she do for a living? That was my guess, a nun. <laughs> Maybe in her spare time. <laughs> it turns out she's actually a nurse. You see, this was from the, from the early 1904s. Has anybody ever heard of uh, Florence Nightingale? Yes. So you know she was a pioneer statistician. She essentially invented statistics, or co-created statistics, graphic visualization of inform uh, tec technical information. But she was also the first advocate to say for having fresh air in hospitals. It's not a good idea to keep the windows always closed and the doors closed when you have sick people in a room. And so one of the solutions that she came up with, besides deciding, designing hospitals with large windows, was actually to give nurses large heads. And you know, nurses are supposed to be very energetic, walk briskly, and so they produce this flow air, which apparently helped the patients. <laughs> It's, I'm not making this up, just, just look it up. Um, so what can we say about a Drosti picture? First of all, we can say that it has a center. So how do you find the center? You locate any one point in the picture that you especially like. In my case, the tip of the lady's nose. And then you go ahead and you locate the same tip of the nose in the next iteration, and on, and on, and on. So what do you get? You get a sequence of points. And it can be proved that the sequence, this sequence of points that you obtain, number one, converges. And it converges to a certain point Z0, which does not depend on the particular spot that you started with. If I had picked her elbow, I would have gotten the same point, and so forth. That's known as the center of the Drosti picture. 
It also has a scaling factor, which is very easy to find. You simply take the ratio between the size of one object, again, of your choice, in the first large image, say, in my case, it was the height of the mug on the tray, then you, you measure the size of the same object in the next iteration, and then you do the ratio. And so that ratio is the uh, scaling factor. What's the takeaway? It's a number which is always bigger than one. And the bigger the scaling factor, the harder it is to draw many iterations, right? Um, also, notice that whereas to find the center of the drasty picture, you have to have an infinite sequence of points and work with it. To find the scaling factor, you just need one iteration. Uh, it turns out by my very own scientific <laughs> measurements that the Drosted Cocoa Box has a scaling factor of approximately 6.5. So the first cup is about 6.5 times taller than the, than the second one. Now, it turns out that Drosted Pictures, which centered at the origin in this representation, can be obtained by applying this conformal map for this particular choice of exponent. This is the scaling factor. So it's the, if the scaling factor is different from zero, this is a complex number which is not purely real. Now, how do you do this? You start by applying this map to an incomplete rendition of the original picture. In the Droste box, it would be the nurse holding a tray that has a cup on it and an empty rectangle. And then, you apply the same map again to the empty spot, so you produce a sequence of iterated functions, like this, and you keep doing it. For the Droste Coco box, this would be our map. Now, why do we know that by proceeding this way ad libitum, you fill the picture completely? It's because of the fact that if this imaginary part is different from zero, then this map takes a ray starting at the origin and maps it into a spiral centered at Z naught. So in practical visualization, of course, it is impossible to see this infinite iteration process going on forever. For instance, because of limitations of the human eye. Um, so let's keep this in mind as we look at this iconic example, which I am sure people in this room are familiar with. How many people have never seen this before? Okay, I'm really glad <laughs> that there are a few who haven't. So you are not gonna get bored by what we are about to say. So this is a famous print by Cornelius Asher, and it's called Print Gallery. Good luck trying to pronounce this in its original language. And what do we see here? We have a young man which is standing in a gallery, in an exhibition gallery, and he's looking at this one particular print of a seaport. You see there's a ship here. And then he keeps looking at this print. He follows the buildings on the key that are designed on the print. And he discovers that among these buildings, there is the very same gallery where he is standing, looking at the painting. Notice that there is a mysterious empty spot. This is just the way the print is. It's not a bad picture, it's just the way it is. And so the, the joke begins, right? I mean, there is this group of three people. You have a mathematician, you have an artist and a computer scientist. They go to the pub and after two or three or five beers too many, they tell one another, I bet you that Asher's print is a drasty picture. And I'm going to prove it, <laughs> which is what they did experimentally. And they postulated that the scaling factor should be very large, the number 256, which explains why you have that very big empty spot at the center of the picture. And so then, in theory, one should be able to get an idealized, that is to say, completely fillable version of the print by applying this conformal map. So now, um, in 2005, I'm sorry, I have a, so it, it's, actually, it's actually in 2003, this is a typo, okay, in 2003, it, it's still impossible to do a filling process forever, but in 2003 there was technology to carry it out a few more steps, which is exactly what they did, let's see if I can manage it, 
So this is what they did. Oops. Even putting in empty slides, I still go too fast, right? So this is what they got, you know, by iterating a few times. And you see that by the last iteration, I think they were able to do eight. Is this the last one? I think this is the last one. You see that you still have the empty spot, of course, right? You can't get rid of that by finitely many iterations. Okay. A very short digression. What about the Droste effect before the Droste chocolate box? So it turns out that in the art world, they have their own word to represent the image within image contact concept. They call it mise en abim, which in, in English means placement in abyss. This idea that you keep going on and on and on and on, right? It feels like an abyss. And uh, definitely predates the design of the cocoa box. And the earliest known instance is this masterpiece of medieval art by Giotto in Rome, my hometown, the Pinacoteca Vaticana. I've never been able to see this actual painting because of the lines. So many tourists wanting to see it. I haven't been able to yet. It's the Stefaneschi triptych. And so you see, it's made out of three panels, but we want to focus on the center one. Because if you look at a detail in the center one, you will realize that it is what looks like a one iteration drastic picture. So this is the throne of the Church of Rome. This is St. Peter sitting on it. And then you have the uh, Stefaneschi Cardinal who, commit, who was paying for this painting right there. He's holding something in his hands, which is precisely a miniature version of the very same triptych. Um, the scaling factor has been computed by a student like you guys, Kay Horick at Smith College. I've never met Kay. There just so happens to be some version of my talk on uh, YouTube. And her complex analysis teacher asked the students to take a look at this, you know, video before on the first day of class. And she did. And then she decided, Kay decided to write a paper on, you know, how art and historical context and mathematical context interact on some iconic pieces. And she actually found this piece that I was not aware of. So I'm really grateful to her. Um, so the scaling factor that she computed is about 19.5. And now if we try to place this work into historical context, but it's clear that in the 1300s, there was no complex analysis, right? There was no complex analysis. The idea of imaginary unit didn't come for another 300 years, Descartes. Certain equations were simply deemed labeled impossible, and we know which ones, right? Um, and her uh, case interpretation of this is she says, that the use of this recursive image within image is a metaphor for the continuing rule of the Catholic Church, which at the time in the 1300s was perceived as an infinite cycle that would go on and on forever. And I owe it to Kay, I didn't know this, um, that of course the, 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 the Rust effect has become part of pop culture. I'm a big fan of Pink Floyd. How many people have heard of Pink Floyd? Okay, we have a few hands. I'm relieved. I had never heard of this one particular album, Amagama. And unfortunately, I can't show you a picture of the cover art because there is no, none in the public domain. But if you have, you know, some music subscription, you can find easily the picture. And if you take the time to listen to the music as I did this morning, you'll realize right away that there's a pretty good connection between the you know, design on the cover and the music is very hypnotic and repetitive. I'll just say that. Um, but also, if you've ever, if you've ever had the laughing cow, little cheese wedges, which originally are from France, so I have here the original picture. The box is actually a drastic picture, which we can't see from this poor definition image. But if you look at the cow's earrings you'll see that they contain the very same picture of the box. So it's become a pop culture phenomenon. So end of the digression. Let's go back to, to the histories track. So it's clear that by the 1900s, the oceans had been conquered, right? People, I mean, this beautiful ocean liners, 
never mind the Titanic. Um, we're going all over the place. And so what was the next frontier? The next frontier was the sky, uh, conquering the sky. We had a visionary prior to this, Leonardo, who was already thinking about this, and he had some ideas for flying machines, but we're not talking about those. So let's get to the 1900s. The, the frontier now is to conquer the skies. And so the new goal is to design an airplane wing that produces a force in physics is known as lift, which is strong enough to keep an airplane up in the air. Never mind how we manage to get the airplane up there, that's not our concern. Our concern is how does it stay up in the air once it, got, it gets up there? And it turns out that there is this principle in physics, the Bernoulli principle, that says essentially that everything depends on the way that the air circulates around the wings. And it is the shape of the wing, the cross section of the wing. I chose this um, t-shirt on purpose <laughs> for today. It's the shape of the cross section that determines the way that the air circulates around it. So it's really important to be able to study the way that the air circulates around the cross wings, the cross section of the wing, based on the shape of the wing. Now, one way to do this is to apply a conformal map from the unit disk. And which conformal map it is? It is the Joukowsky transformation that we were talking about at the very beginning of this talk. I lifted this slide from NASA. I'm very grateful to NASA for having the slide on the website. I'm not very happy with the way the slides is designed because, for instance, this um, blue lines don't make sense to me. You'll tell me if they make sense to, to you, maybe at the end of the talk. You see, if this is an X and a Y axis, then you would have the origin there, but this map is problematic at the origin. So what is that? I don't know, you'll tell me. But the point is that, as we said, to keep the airplane up in the air, you want to be able to say a lot, apply the Bernoulli principle, check that these lines satisfy the Bernoulli principle, whatever it says. And a convenient way to do that is to see to, their, to look at their counterparts around a disk via this map. Now, the interesting thing, and it would be great to have an animation, I couldn't find an animation online. If some of you, some of you is very good at coding, see if you can do a little movie that shows what happens if you move the center of the circle around. So if you move the center of the circle around, maybe Saleh, you can do that. So then the shape is gonna change. It's gonna wiggle like a fish. And until you get the shape that does whatever Bernoulli says you have to do to stay up in the air. And so here we have a picture that shows several airfoil shapes. It's interesting to see that the very earliest one by the Wright brothers goes back to 1908. And then you see you have one by Blériot, 1909. But then right after that, 1912, you have Tchaikovsky, the one that he got by applying this conformal map. So at this point, I would love to be able to say, okay, fast forward to the 2000s, the skies have been conquered. So what's the next frontier? Well, the next frontier would be space travel, right? Unfortunately, Star Trek has a physicist in the flying crew of the Enterprise. It does not have a mathematician. And I'm not aware of any applications of conformal mapping to space travel. You know, I mean, there's a lot of analytic geometries, parabolas, slingshots that get involved when you move, you know, things through space travel. I'm not aware of any use of conformal mapping. But if you are, please reach out and let me know. So in the meantime, we have to do, we have to fill this remaining 10 minutes some way or another. And so then we move on to what up until very recently I thought was whimsical conformal mapping, which means takes us to the work of Darcy Wentworth Thompson, this gentleman here. Um, I love, I love the Peaky Blinder type of outfit. 
which I thought was very funny until Peaky Blinders became a major <laughs> you know, Netflix series. And so you see things and fashions keep moving around. So he was a biologist, a mathematician, a classical scholar, and an explorer. So here we have a picture of him on an archaeological dig. You see, he was digging um, specimen. In other words, we can think of Darcy Thompson as a real life Indiana Jones. <laughs> I apologize for this picture. The, the Indiana Jones experts tell me that this was the worst movie in the series. It's only the only image that I was able to get from the public domain. There must be a connection. What matters here is that you see the setup is pretty much the same. We are on some kind of a dig and it, they're wearing the same hat. <laughs> um, so where does conformal mapping come into this picture? It comes into Thompson's main opus, the book on growth and form. How many people have heard of this book? Power to you. So this book was first published by Cambridge, and it still is. They will never give up their rights on this book. It first appeared in 1917. It has had over 40 reprints to date. I think the latest one goes to back to 2013 or 17, I forget. This is essentially the J.K. Rowling analog in the world of science. And um, in this book, which is very big, by the way, he died, um, I mean, uh, Darcy Thompson died in the 1940s, I forget, 48, I think I said over there. So if you go to your library, they will certainly have many, many copies of this book. And you might try and request the old, oldest copy on loan. And if it's a copy that was published before the 1940s, there's a small chance that the very same Darcy Thompson held that copy in his very own hands. You might be able to channel him. Anyway, this book, which like I said, is very, it's really a big tome, explores many things. Uh, by the way, it was a source of inspiration for Alan Turing in his um, pioneering work on the study of the shape of animals, hides, I guess, the zebras and giraffes and so on. Among other things, it inspires modern mathematicians to this day. But the reason why we're interested in is because among the many things that you find there, you, you see that his study is um, the extent to which relationships among different species of animals can be described using what he mysteriously refers to as conformal transformations. And these are pictures from the book. So, you know, you have this pair, this pair, and this pair. These are all fish, but in the book you'll, feel, you'll see pictures for all kinds of animals and vegetables. And so you see in each pair you have a depiction of an existing fish species. I'm not able to read this, but if you get the book, you'll be able to. And then you see that there are these very mysterious grids. So the way I like to think about this is you have this sheet of rubber, which you can stretch in any direction you want. And then you slap a fish on the original rectangular um, slab. You draw this grid of perpendicular lines. Then you take the fish away and you have the contour of the fish. And then you start stretching it. And then by stretching it the right way, you get another fish which actually exists in nature. Right, and in the process, also the, the original grid has been stretched. And so you have, you know, different outcomes here. So this fish pairs that you get one from the other by stretching this rubber sheets are called homologous. And so the point is that the stretching that you're doing is some kind of mathematical function that you are applying to that grid. And this function has to have certain properties. One of them is that it has to preserve a given number, in fact, at least seven, 
landmark points. So you could pick, for example, obviously the eye. So you want eye to go to eye. Um, the upper attachment point of the side fin, wherever that is, like this point. Um, anterior ends of three fins, I don't know, one, uh, two, and three. Two points where the tail meets the body. So you want all of those points to be preserved in the image fish. Seven, at least seven. And this tells you, in order to get a picture of another existing fish. But this tells you then that none of these functions can be the image of a conformal map. Well, we know that already, right? By looking at the picture. Why do we know that? Angles. Exactly. The angles are not preserved. So we know that. But there is also a deeper reason for that. The reason is that, you know, see, in order to get from this to this, I have to have at least six landmark points that are preserved. But the Riemann mapping theorem says that you cannot guarantee with a conformal map more than three. Okay, very good. So there is this obstacle to thinking of conformal maps as a good model for this uh, fish representations. And so this takes us to the real itty gritty subject, which is morphometric analysis. It's the study of shape change and of the forces that drive the shape change. In this case, the shape change is going from one fish species to the other, right, that we have seen in these pairs. And so it's about, the subject is about how the shape of a living organism evolves over time. That's one aspect. Another aspect which we have seen in this book is how the shapes of living organisms change in relation to one another. And then there is the specific subfield of planar morphometric analysis, which is specialized to planar living organisms. So lives and fish, for instance. And so this fast forward to 2013, there's two mathematicians, uh, Jones and Mahadevan. By the way, Mahadevan is really, how many people have, have heard of El Mahadevan in this room? So I, I like to think of him, very good. I like to think of him as yet another modern uh, Indiana Jones. He's a professor of, um, help me, physics, mathematics, and biology at Harvard. So this is what it means to be an Indiana Jones in, uh, in modern day. And so they said, okay, it's clear that you, can go from, you cannot go from species e, A to species B using a conformal map because of that seven point issue. But maybe we can do that with a quasi conformal map, which is almost a more interesting object in higher dimension than a conformal map. Why? Well, because quasi conformal map do allow for angle deformation up to a certain point. You cannot change an angle into a cusp, but you can change an angle into another angle. They also allow for lots of landmark points, which is what precisely what happened in the pictures that we showed. So those are the good points of this model, choice of model. But there's also bad points. By applying a quasi-conformal mapping, you don't get a single fish species that comes out of the process. You get several possible choices. But of course, mother nature is very precise. There can only be one solution. So how are, we, how, how are you going to find the one solution out of all the possible ones that come out of this mathematical model? So they decided to apply Thompson's criteria for map selection from the book. And Thompson stated the following two criteria. First, the grid deformation should be as simple as possible. There's a, of course, there's an issue of minimizing energy. So simplicity is the right goal. Secondly, it should give insight into the underlying physical process of going from one piece to the other by providing a model for the forces that drive shape change. Why is, a le why is a little seedling growing this way instead of that way? What are the forces that are driving the shape change? And it turns out that in both cases, one can formulate these two requirements that Thompson gave in a mathematical way. 
The first condition is that the map should be a local shear. I know that Liz's PhD advisor did work on shears. Did you do work on shears? Do I remember? No, but she, Barrett did. And so there is a specific definition of local shear, but we're running out of time, so I'm not going to go do that. And for the second one, the shear has to have minimal variation, whatever that means. It's a concept from, from PDE. And then at that point, you want to apply technology from applied numerical PDE that is going to give you a solution, one solution, that you cannot get with a beautiful, clean formula as we are used to get in complex analysis. You can only compute numerically. Now, the fun fact is that once they got their numerical solution, they said, you know what, we're going to test it numerically on Thompson's pictures. And so how did they do that? They picked, you know, a pair of homologous fish from the book. And then what they, uh, here are, you see, this, these are the seven points we were talking about. And so then what did they do? They took the input fish and they filled it up with little circles, with little disks. I have no idea what the color coding is for, right? I mean, there's some color coding going on. I don't know. I have no idea what that's for. So then they applied their numerical algorithm to each of these little disks, and they plotted the outcomes, I mean, the, the, the output objects. And so you see that each little disk was mapped into a little ellipse. And the interesting thing, as far as their experiment goes, goes, is that they wanted to see whether the little ellipses were going to fit the shape of the output fish from the book. Now, the, reasons, the reason why we go from little disks to little ellipses is because the map, the numerical map that they're constructed is not conformal, it's only quasi-conformal. So angles are deformed, which means that disks are changed into ellipses. They're very happy with the fact that they had, you see this filling by disks here of the original fish, and they get a corresponding filling by ellipses of the output fish. Things didn't get out of the margins. They don't know how to explain the fact that the axis of these ellipses seem to be a little bit off kilt. They don't know, right? But as far as they, they are concerned, as applied mathematicians, this to them is a satisfactory solution to the problem, to the selection problem. And so I thought, this is it. Goodbye conformal maps in the world of morphometric analysis. You have to go with quasi-conformal. But it turns out it isn't. And I discovered this only about three weeks ago at a conference that you and I participated in, um, in Cambridge. And so here I'm just going to finish. I, I haven't read the paper yet. There hasn't been time. I'm just going to say a couple of keywords. So Martin Benamar and her postdoc, Anna Dai, realized that Conformal mapping, and here we're being very imprecise, in fact, a flow of conform, a time flow of conformal map appears to be effective for modeling the fenestration phenomena in leaf growth of the Monstera deliciosa plant. How many people know about the, 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 the Swiss cheese plant? I know it's very, very popular among the young generations. Now, because of the usual public domain issues, I wasn't able to lift a beautiful picture of a Monstera deliciosa from online, but that was not a problem because I have a fantastic Monstera myself in my office. And I apologize to my friends who were visiting. Um, <laughs> that's the only picture I have of my Monstera, so I hope they won't mind <laughs> being shown in this picture. But you can see the fenestration phenomenon is the phenomenon whereby a leaf has holes, naturally develops holes in it. And sometimes the original leaf, you know, the green tender leaf, the tiny leaf that, you know, at the very beginning already has the holes marked in it. Other times it doesn't and then the holes develop. And this is something, understanding this process is something of great interest to people who work in biomathematics for a number of reasons which I'm not able to explain. So in their case, the question was not, to show how one leaf is turned into another, but rather how the same leaf, leaf changes over time. And it appears, like I said, I haven't read the paper yet, that a flow of conformal maps might be the way 
to correctly, accurately model this phenomenon. And so, this is all. I have, I have a few references here. If you're interested, um, I encourage you to go over them. I believe that this um, business of doing morphometric analysis using complex analysis, conformal maps or quasi-conformal maps, has a great future ahead. And so if you're interested in the subject, I would strongly encourage you to read some of the literature. I definitely am going to. Thank you. Thank you very much for that great, wonderful, engaging, innovating talk about this wide range of phenomena all over. We have time for a few questions, and then uh, once we wrap up with questions, we just have a few announcements, then we'll uh, break if we want to. I'm sorry, what was that again? Yes. Uh, that's a good question. So I believe that's the case for Mobius transformation. If you add two conformal maps, do you still get a conformal map in general? I don't think so. Although, although the Joukowsky map happens, which is the sum of two, happens to be conformal, but not in general. Very good question. Composition, yes. Right, the composition of two maps, two conformal maps is still conformal, but the sum would be problematic. Are those um, quasi-conformal maps, are they I would guess that it does, right? Because this, this two, the two laws that we described, uh, bounded angle deformation should take place under composition. So I believe that they form a group under composition, quasi-conformal. The, the, the group of? The group of all possible fish, right? Where you just... Exactly, the group, yes. That, and it would be very interesting to figure out how large that group can be and what it comprises. Maybe that's been studied in phylotaxis, right? I don't know, evolutionary trees, right? There's this branch of biomathematics that study evolutionary trees. And so that might be something to actually, you know, look into there in that, in that context. Where, where? Just a second, I need to hear you again. So like Riemann mapping here mentioned something to do with a maximum of three. Yes, yes, because so in the, the, the classical formulation of the Riemann mapping theorem says that if you have a domain D, simply connected domain D, and you fix a point Z naught, W naught in this domain, so then there is going to be a unique conformal map from the unit disk to the domain D, which takes zero to Z naught, or W naught, sorry, and such that F prime of zero is real valued and positive. And that can be translated into saying there is a unique conformal map that takes from the disk to the domain that takes three prescribed points into three prescribed points. And that's it. You cannot do better. Did Maha chose the shear to be too just arbitrarily, or is there a principle that the level of shear would determine the deformation? Right. I think, I mean, it's been a while since I read the paper, but I do believe that there is some principle that they implement in selecting the shear that will do the job. Yeah. Otherwise, it would seem that the 
arbitrary, right? I mean, I would say, guess that, you know, one guiding principle is that shears are very simple maps, right? But even so. He's quite creative. I have known him for a long time. Facial recognition nowadays, you get like a fruit, and then you can like, you know, those silly Snapchat filters, like can you kind of stretch your face down? I was wondering if that's related. I would say, borrow the book from the library. <laughs> and, and you will see that it is applied in many contexts, some of which in this day and age, we would consider ethically objectionable. So definitely I would, but fish is pretty safe because it's, because it's uh, flat. And also, you know, there's not a lot of unethical things that you can do with a fish, but I would recommend to, to take, you know, to, to borrow a copy of the book. And if you get an old one, you're welcome. If you have questions over this side of the room, and I can't see you just wave back and forth. This is general classes. Best to see your hand and wave back and forth. And have it stuck up. The dynamic zone. Yes. So I read work before on phylogenetics where they try to apply math to like index spaces of you know possible species and like I'm not a biologist, but I know there's like an nice hierarchy. And they try to index them to describe how they're related. So anyway, my question is, do these be formal maps? Is there like, how much can they be used? Because I, I think Thompson, maybe he claimed, or I read somebody, I read somebody who said that he thought he could do everything <laughs> with, with these conformal <laughs> maps, but there's certainly a lot more going on. Um, but anyway, how much is this related to like, say, tax? Philotaxes. Like right, because mm -hmm. if I make a group, elements and then classify uh, species based on, you know, the string that is needed to describe them. That's so an, is this interest, is this for that? So that's an excellent question, but I'm not the person to answer it. It does make sense to me. And in fact, you know, when you, when you were asking the group about the group structure, I thought I knew that that's where you were headed. It's a, it's the right question to, to ask, but I'm not the person to answer it. It is, right? Yes, it is amazing. We have time for one more question before we got a further announcement. But maybe if there are no more questions, can I make a comment? Since we're going, you know, later to lunch, in case you lack topics of conversation. You know, as I've been working on this lecture for a long time, over and over, this question has been popping up in my mind. You know, you look at the strange relations between existing fish species, and then you see there's a quasi-conformal map. And this brings the following question to mind. There is no yes or no answer, right? It's something to discuss. Is the theorem proved or is it discovered? I think that's a question that applies to this kind of mathematics. And maybe that's a question that people like you, who hold their, our future in their hands, should discuss and think about. All right, let's take our speaker again. Thank you.